parental will be told to go home when they're walking with their children. And these are British born ladies who live and work in Birkenhead being told to go home in front of their children. Now their children are the same age as my son. I cannot imagine what my son would think if that happened when I was here just because my skin colour was different when I wore a hijab. That's something that we need to tackle and we need to change. It doesn't help your community and it's, it's quite dangerous as well for the future because it just divides us and if we are divided, how, how does that help? So I think pretty much that's what we're looking to do over the next year in Birkenhead with regards to that. Does anybody have any questions or anything you'd like to ask? Yeah, a couple of questions. Um, one of the things I've missed, I'm sorry, but uh, you, you did have up on the board uh, improving uh, the standard of living, uh, like Stone at board, the board like that. I think you're dead right on the school visits because I uh, worked on the railways for 43 years. I saw from a signal box the uh, people crossing the live rail. One in particular sticks in my mind is it not very when a young lad went across, fell, hit the rail, or well, you can imagine the rest of it. Uh, but I also think that we need more community police on the ground, and I'll tell you why I believe that. I also work in the local cemeteries. I do work in the local cemeteries, so to say, and I do it to tidy the graves for people in the, those cemeteries, whatever cemetery it is. Now, I was in there at one time, and this was at to be Frankie Cemetery, um, and I heard this banging, and I thought, what the hell's that? It was about four o'clock, five o'clock in the afternoon, it was just getting dark. When I went over to where there was a couple of, a group of lads there, demolishing the bins, one of the bins. So I went over, I tackled them, tackled them on my own, and all the rest of it, and uh, I noticed and recognised the uniforms that they were wearing for the school. So I said to them, right, I've got a cop do you are, and I'm going to go to your school. With that, believe it or not, whether it be because it was Frank B, West Kirby, whatever, they actually absolutely went to pieces. Please do not go to my school, please, we'll put it back. Up. So I made them put it all back and put it in back. Um, but I do believe that the school visits are crucial. Um, I think the community police is crucial because I live near Coronation Park and we used to have a couple of community police went through there every day, twice a day, sometimes three times a day. Last week alone, uh, a local group by the way, uh, does the children's area there and it's fantastic, I think it's Breesby, Breesby community and it's a fantastic, just quickly now. Thank you. Um, Last week, a group of lads smashed a lot of glass, and this is where young kids are playing up. When the community <coughs> police officers used to go around there, none of that used to happen. And finally, this centre is absolutely brilliant for what it's producing and what it's doing. And I, I've got to say, I hold your hands up to you. Um, I'm not sure. Um, yeah, quickly, obviously, what I would say about the community policing teams, our numbers have reduced. As I'm sure you're aware, police budgets have, have dropped considerably. Merseyside's lost 20,000 officers since 2010, and that's police officers, it's not including support staff. I worked this area several times ago now, eight years ago, um, and my policing team is somewhat different to what it was then. Um, yeah, I would love to have more community staff on the area. I, I, I don't hold our budget, that's something that might be something that we sent to government. However, what I would say, and it's vital to everybody here, is you need to make us aware of those areas where you've got problems. No, I don't have staff available to go everywhere like I did a number of years ago. But what we will do and what we do do is listen to where you report incidents. So I've got staff that go through our incident logs and then give you the hotspot areas where I can see. So I don't cover that part, but I, I cover this part of Burton Head, so I will get told where the social behaviour is with young people in Oxford Road, or I get young people in, in Conway Street. And, and I get those instances, but if you don't tell me, I can't put a policing response into that. So I will, if you see me at the end, I will give you the email address of your local policing team, or you can contact us via the website, I can arrange for that to be sent out to you. And again, you do need to make us aware of what's going on. I think the prime example being the unreported hate crime. That wasn't reported, we weren't aware of it, until I was invited to come speak to some of the ladies that are at the Dean Centre, and that was how I found out about the hate crime. Because of that, we may have been able to put a police response
collapsing. You know, I am guessing that right across communities, people are telling us what's happening, so we can't put that response in. I can't promise we'll solve everything because, we, we, unfortunately, we won't. As soon as we get rid of one group of children causing ASB, the next lot have grown to that age where they want to challenge society, and that's what they do. It's like paper the false bridge, but we've got to keep trying and we've got to keep working with people. So, okay, thanks very much, Casey. Um, sorry, Alan, yes, one of the other members. Um, who came later. Just, just, <laughs> uh, just a quick question, and I apologise if it's not directly related to what you're talking about, but it's just really referring to the, the terrible work conditions we've got at the moment. Yep. Are you, have you been able to step up the work you do with the council and other agencies to reduce the number of, of uh, homeless people that are sleeping like rough? I've done quite a lot of work around homeless individuals and perceived homelessness in and around Birkenhead. I work really closely as part of a member of the Birkenhead Town Centre team um, to tackle some of the issues linked to homelessness. And we've had a homelessness awareness day only very recently, which was managed and organised by Kirsty, one of the homeless outreach workers who works with Rural Ways to Recovery. Not everybody who is sat in Birkenhead looking dishevelled with a sleeping bag is necessarily homeless. So first of all, <coughs> that issue that does need to be tackled and those individuals and how we target them and there's, there are processes in place for that. A lot of the homeless individuals that I speak to, I've offered some of them lifts to go down to the night shelf at the YMCA and they have declined for a number of reasons. For me, a big part of tackling the homelessness issue is tackling drug and alcohol abuse because what I've seen, and this isn't, this isn't for everybody, and I do not want to sort of like tell all homeless people with the same bush, but what I have found is that a lot of the homeless people I come into contact with in Birkenhead have got quite serious substance misuse problems on top of mental health issues, or and it, it's a really complex issue. So for me, if you want to help homeless individuals, <coughs> give to the charities in Birkenhead. Again, at the end, I can give you some information about that because. If you feed, give five pounds to a charity, you're going to feed three homeless people. If you give that to one homeless person, you might have actually helped them buy their drugs. So I would strongly urge you not to give to individuals. By all means, help them. You can ring up the homeless hotline. The YMCA has got an outreach shelter which is open. If you can use that, you get put on. The, you can go on the main stay register to be there with alternative accommodation. But the vast majority of people in Birkenhead are turning that down. Thanks, Kitty. Can I just say as well, at the moment, during this really, really awful weather, uh, the YMCA are taking donations of hats and gloves and scarves and everything. Uh, anybody has got one to do? Yeah. Oh, the deeds, well, even though. I wondered if that was what that was. Yeah. 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 Great. Okay, thanks, Katie. Oh, thanks, Steve. No, it, just, just to reiterate mm -hmm. something you said, we've, we've got issues, Jill and I and, and George, up at um, <laughs> Some people are confused with <coughs> important crime being labelled, I'll say the word, a bit, a bit, a grass. Okay. And well, the message we've got to get out there is that people we should be poor crime because where you have, I think the point was made about very finite resources, unless those crimes are reported, you won't be on the, you won't be getting the attention. The police will have to put their resources where the most reports are coming from. So if anyone in the room confuses me, you know. If anyone wants to give names of criminals uh, who are operating in their area, then use us. We're, we're very good at being coppers and arcs and, and things like that. That's what we will do. We will take that responsibility away from you in terms of in, in, information and informants. But do report any crime you see. If you witness a hate crime, report it. If you see something going on, report it. Because if it's not reported, it, it's off the radar and it doesn't help at all. So please report every crime and use us if you want as informants. Thank you, thanks Steve. Okay. Yes, Molly. Um, it's just, um, thank you for your um, talk. Um, I've been working towards racial equality for about 35 years. So um, it's very... Just have a chat at the end. Yes. So it's, I mean, I'm very impressed with, with how things go. Um, we, the Bergen Heads constituency Labour Party, is trying to organise a great get-together in memory of Joe Cox, who was tragically murdered. And that was a result of a hex And what um, they're trying to do is to get people together. Um, so I was interested in your day that you want people yeah. to get together. 
where did it get together? Um, we got the Strano Rovers. Get together and the Brazilian Centre. You know, if you've got four different people coming together, that's that. It's a safe and top of the other perspective. We have a list of questions. Thank you. Thanks again, Katie. This one is for Councillor Matthew Patrick, who is the Brook Council Cabinet Member for Localism and Engagement, and he wants to talk to you about the future of neighbourhood work. And he is desperate for his main uh, officer, Rachel, to come up and help him because he wouldn't <laughs> be able to do it by himself. So, uh, Rachel Musgrave, who's a senior officer here. In um, so, um, Chair asked me before the meeting started, how long would it be? And I said, 10 minutes. And then, and then the Chair said, everybody says that, we'll time you. And I said, well, then it might be 20. So um, I just want to give you a quick talk um, to make sure myself through a small slide um, presentation, but I'm conscious I'm standing in front of them, um, about neighbourhood working. Now, what I think it would be quite helpful to do, we're doing a review currently of how our neighbourhood working model, um, how effective that is. So I want to talk you through how that review has taken place, um, what findings we're having um, at the moment, and maybe what some of the next steps may be. Um, I think why this is important. I think before I want to address that, I'm going to go back. Um, I think it's really important to talk about what we established here with constituency committees, um, and why I think it's really important that we do a review. Um, <coughs> I think it was a number of years ago the constituency committees were placed area forums. Um, and the constituency committees are an opportunity for residents from their constituency to come together and hear updates as we've just heard from um, the, the police and um, sometimes from fire or health or other key um, key services in their area and to raise issues um, that matter and that are local to them. Um, probably useful given some of the questions tonight to let people know that there are four, uh, one from Birkenhead, one for Wallasey, one for Wirral South and one for Wirral West. Um, so you, are, you can attend your own constituency committee and raise issues that are relevant to you and to your patched area. It sort of gives everyone an opportunity to be able to, to raise issues that matter to them for their local area. So why, why is our neighbourhood working strategy important? Um, no one can read this, so I'm essentially going to give you a, an overview. Um, various studies show that 97% um, of residents um, believe that their local communities could be improved if residents had greater input. And I think that would be a view shared by absolutely everybody in the room, including councillors who are spending their lives trying to knock on doors and deliver leaflets and, and draw out views from residents. So I think everybody would fully, um, fully agree with that. Um, half of the residents of Wirral don't believe that they can influence things in their area at the moment. And I think that's a real shame, and I think it's something we have to change. And I think um, I know that um, I'm, I'm from the Labour administration. I know that our group of councillors have determined that that takes place, and that we and that we do manage to change that. Um, but I'm sure I'm sure all councillors across Wirral want to see more participation um, and for residents to have um, influence in their area. Um, and finally, um, the Wirral Council is driven by the 2020 vision that was introduced a few years ago and it has 20 key pledges. And everything we do is designed to achieve those pledges now. And when it's been broken down, because these are some of them quite grand statements, so when the, those statements are broken down into action points, we've identified that 75% of all of the actions relating to that um, require better working in our communities. Um, Chair will feel smug to know that it's probably taken me five minutes to get through a tenth of the oh, presentation. Do you do another five minutes? I'll, I will speed. I will speed up. I really will. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Rachel to help us talk through this bit. Um, but just very quickly, that there was a review, and um, I've asked uh, Rachel to lead a review into how effective the current constituency committees are. In, and I asked for three specific things, and then Rachel's going to talk us through that. Um, what models out there? Um, are there for neighbourhood working. Um, there are different councils across the country that have effective ways of engaging residents. I wanted to know more about them. Um, what value could we place on the investments made in the committees thus far? Um, obviously with dwindling budgets, um, we've got to make sure that every penny we spend on the Wirral is achieving its purpose. And I asked Rachel and the team to do that. And finally, and actually most importantly for me, was what were the views of our partners, our residents, and our councillors, and our communities more broadly. 
So I'm going to ask Rachel at this point to stand up and talk a little bit about those things. So of those three strands, this first one was about, um, we undertook a desk-based exercise, essentially looking at exploring the models that other councils, and also looking internationally as well about ideas about how we could better engage with local residents. So you can see um, what we found from that as a piece of work is that um, neighbourhood working or working with communities means look different things to different um, areas, and there's lots of different models that operate across the country in terms of what that looks like. Um, nobody has formally evaluated a model to say that this is the best one or this works better than another one, but there were some things that were identified that were part of the success factors for those models. So self-perceived um, models where neighbourhood working or working with communities was particularly good. So you can see those success factors were how that initial investment was, de was determined, the different ways of engaging, so not just one way of talking to local people, different ways of doing that. Um, ownership and transparency and we also looked at things that made those models not work so well so there are things like that cultural change amongst both the staff working in local authorities local residents um, views on allocations of funds and finding different <coughs> ways in which to engage with local people um, and finally I suppose the summary from that piece of work is there is no kind of answer to this it's about finding the right way that works for us and utilising the information to determine what's the best way to work for women. Um, okay, so the second piece of work, as Matthew said, that we undertook was we undertook a review of um, the social value of return on the investments made through the core budget. So each of the constituency committees, as you probably know, is given a core budget of £50,000 each year to invest in community projects determined by the committee. Um, over, we looked at the budget for the period since the committees were set up, so to 2013, and for this it goes up to the end of 27, well it was at the summer of 2017. Um, and so that totaled across the across rural £566,000, and you can see there there's a difference in the um, scale of projects. So back in head here we looked at 20 projects, uh, 39 in Wallasey, 19 in rural south and 191 in rural west and that's because there's different models operating so i think that's an important point to make um, if anyone's traveled around to the different committees you'll see that they do all operate slightly differently and <coughs> the models for investment money also operate slightly differently so to give you an example for that in rural west it operates on a small grant scheme and in rural south for example they um, invest on small commissioned projects, so they'll pick a priority and then invest a bigger amount of money into it. Um, and what you will see here is that the investments made reflect the things that people have said are important to them living in those local areas. And the results of that show for every um, one pound we spent um, across Wirral, we got two pounds sixty-eight back for that money. Um, and obviously there were some recommendations in terms of how we need to make sure we keep monitoring that. Now I thought obviously for you it would be interesting to see what that meant in terms of Birkenhead. So we looked at the 20 projects and there's a bit of a breakdown <coughs> here. And it shows that there was more spend in Birkenhead on things like anti-social behaviour and clean up days in Birkenhead. And also it enabled us to have a bit of a um, bigger look at some of the projects that were done. So for an example, project here, so the Neo Cafe, Beachwood Play and Community Centre Hub in North Birkenhead Development Trust, you see that return on investment increases from the £2.68 to £6.21 for every pound spent. So there are some slight differences in terms of the project, so you get more return back depending on the, the schemes. Um, and then finally, we did um, a, a piece, as Matthew said, talking to lots of people, so um, probably people in this room that were involved in those conversations and um, certainly some of our elected members were involved with that, partners from other organisations, so the police, the fire, the NHS, and to try to understand what they think what we do at the moment is working well and where we could improve that. So um, some of the views that came back was that there was you know, a real consensus that working with um, partners and working with communities was absolutely something we had to do and was very, very much valued by lots of people. Um, and particularly, and it's interesting today, we've talked a lot about community action because that was the bit that people cited over and over again as being you know, really beneficial and feeling like it made a real difference. And that was everybody, that wasn't just residents, that was people working in services, 
um, right, right across the board, and some of the examples were cited, the Improving Life Chances schemes, um, some of the door knocks and the litter picks. Um, as you will know, and as we all know, I'm, we're all born and bred as well, and we are a very different place with lots of different communities with different assets. Um, and I think that was a reflection back to actually, you know, one size doesn't fit all actually, and it was something very much about a local response to local needs. And that came out as a very strong message. And also that we use the existing networks that are in communities to engage with rather than expecting everyone to come to us to engage with. Um, so that was quite a strong message. And I think for um, uh, reflecting that, a particular committee meeting was have always felt to be the best way to speak to everybody who wanted to have a view or an opinion. Um, and there were lots of other reasons I could, I could talk about. Um, the small grant and seed funding was really, really valued, and, I'm sh and we've heard some of the examples here today about how a little bit of money can just get something going and turn all these little bonfires into a big fire. And um, across the board, everyone said, you know, it's not, it's not about you know, building big shiny buildings. A small <coughs> amount of money can really get things off the ground. And similarly, um, a lot of the community groups that we spoke to in the networks were describing, actually, it's not always money. We really value just asking somebody to help us you know, unblock a barrier with something. Um, it might be about some advice about how we set up a group and make it legal, how we draw in money from other agencies. Um, so a whole range of, uh, of advice and support was also really valued. Um, we also got a strong message that um, the dedicated um, officer support that we get really helps things make a difference. So Joe's here tonight, and I'm sure you've all probably benefited, well I know you have, um, from the hard work that she and the rest of the team do, and we've seen that across, in terms of kind of really tackling some of the issues on the ground, and, and also making those connections for, for people as well. Um, so we heard that message very strongly. And similarly, um, local residents talked about it, the, the real need for having a community builder, so how do we connect a network to other community groups because actually that's where some of the real you know opportunities are to make things better um, and finally and I think this reflects probably the time that we did this piece of work which was over the summer and um, I'm sure we can all remember Brexit um, there was a, there was a, a lot coming back from community residents about feeling of ap apathy with the political system so I think it's important to say that. So this kind of sense that there was a bit of tension between um, how we as public services could connect with local people in a way that was meaningful. So I think that's important to share, but, but equally a caveat to this as a piece of work. So hopefully that's a very short summary, and probably not at all within the 10 minutes. <laughs> OK, OK. <laughs> that's worse than done as a five, that's why. I'm sure you'd like to ask some questions, but yes. can I just make a comment first before sure. I do? Sure. Um, I think this committee has had a different focus from the other yes. three. I think we've worked in a different way. Yes. Um, I think what we wanted to do when, when we uh, put our heads to it was to find out what were the real issues that were at the heart of what people in Birkenhead want, and then act as a driver for them. I think we have been successful because we identified as, as our priority uh, food and fuel quality. And I think when we get to Joe's report uh, in a few minutes, we need to see just how much interest. And um, now we've got the Dean doing it as well. But across the world, there's several <coughs> projects that are aimed to feed in Birkenhead. And it has been really successful in that way. What we haven't been able to do is generate interest, really, apart from tonight, which is good turnout tonight. But it is variable. And I don't think everybody here is from Birkenhead. Um, so that's a, another issue. Yeah, we haven't been terribly good at getting people to come along to meetings. And that, I think, is because meetings are boring. Okay. Um, and really nobody wants to sit in meetings for any length of time. But as far as work goes, I think that this committee does drive um, an initiative which we took on board as being one of our main ones and doing that. So it's how do we, how do we let people know what we as councillors are doing, what the council is doing for Birkenhead, how do we listen to them when they're not actually going to keep these meetings themselves, sadly. And also, you're right, absolutely right about the work of, um, of Joe and other constituency managers. It cuts cut through the bureaucracy. If you want something done, you're in Joe, and Joe will get it done. And that's really good. But I'm opening it up now to questions. Can I, can I quickly respond to that point? Mm -hmm. well, I, I will, <coughs> this will be much shorter than my previous uh, contribution. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, um, thanks, thanks, Rachel. Um, we are not yet at a stage where we have a proposed model to take forward. That will need to be developed, a paper needs to be put forward, and that will be taken into cabinet. 
and um, what we are at a stage of doing is knowing where our thinking is going and the thing you mentioned about how you as a committee work differently to the other committees we've recognised and it's been really important to see that there's actually four different ways of working here and the absolute intent the intention is not in any way to stop the good things that happened in committees from happening the idea is essentially to cherry pick them to make sure that, that all committees are facilitated in working in their own individual way and that that can go forward in a really positive sense. So I think that's slightly reassuring. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Since someone wants to make a comment, any of the members want to make a comment or ask a question, or Benson, do it the public? No, I think it's all been said. <coughs> okay, thank you very much, thank you, Matthew, thank you, Rachel. Um, before we move on to uh, Joe's report, uh, I've got Sue Brown here, who is... Uh, I'm not quite sure what the time is, I'm sure you are, but you are um, you are an organiser for volunteers for Wirral Libraries. And you want to, so, okay. you tell us what you are, and tell us what you want to, what your project is. Well, I'm Susan Brown, I'm the chairman of Wirral Society of Arts, um, and part of the creative community. Um, I'm going to start very negative, and then I'll end very positive, so bear with me at the end. I live and work in Wirral, and I am a council taxpayer, and I feel I have a duty of care to council employees who work for me and for us, and I'm sure you, you do too. I've been asked to work with the libraries. Now, I've never come across a workforce who feels more undervalued than the staff of the libraries. Having said that, except for one library, um, which I'll talk about later. Having said that, they're very enthusiastic, and they really, really work hard. Um, they find out on Thursdays where they work the next week. That impacts both their professional and their personal lives. Um, like if I go in and ask, have you gotten brochure stands? They'll say, I haven't worked here for three weeks, things have moved around, I don't know. How they can work with the public as well, I'm not sure, but they're trying. Um, they're only allowed four consecutive leave days at any one time. You try and plan your holidays that way, that's hard. And they're not allowed to be sick. Okay, the reason I was asked in is because the libraries need additional income streams, and they've identified that they, they do need that. And if you visit them, you'll find that they are in beautiful buildings, and there are many ways to create additional income streams for the libraries. But we identified the fact that before we do that, we had to increase footfall with the libraries. Um, I did a quick survey of about 100 people to find out why they didn't use the library, and found out because they didn't know what the opening hours were in the library. Um, it's very difficult. That didn't surprise the library staff at all. Also, we've got a third of the population, which world is no different, that don't have computers in their homes. Um, we have very expensive equipment sitting in the libraries waiting to be used, but how do people find out when they're available to be used? Um, so, how do we remedy this? Well, between us, we devised a troll trail. Um, and we're doing this in partnership with the Festival of Firsts. The Festival of Firsts will help with the advertising with this, and it helps spread the festival throughout the borough as well. Trolls are part of our biking heritage. No one knows what it looks like. We're asking people to make trolls and bring them into the libraries. Um, they can be made out of anything and any size. So the trolls are being brought into the libraries because people have to find out the opening hours to bring them in um, between now and June the 1st. Then we'll, we pick them, we'll pick them up, see what we have, and we'll distribute them and place them in the libraries. Um, I'm making a trail brochure, which will have uh, the opening hours and hopefully a map, and people will then go and find the different trolls in different places. Um, again, the librarians are doing displays about that uh, contribute to the, the Viking heritage, to the heritage in rural, all different things. They're having workshops for children and adults that will, will contribute to the trolls as well. People will complete the forms, bring them into the boxes where the librarians um, will then award a small prize. Um, and there are also prizes for the most beautiful, the best, and the most horrible. <laughs> okay. 24 prizes were donated by Cass Liverpool, Cass Art Liverpool, and the Festival First has pr funded printing costs. So it's the council is not paying for anything. So I have a present for each of you. <laughs> Number one is Troll Trail Leaflets. And then each of you is getting some soft dough so that you can make a troll. <laughs> Thank you.
Do you want to pass uh, yeah. Can you take some of the so pass, pass them that way? Yeah. And pass them this way. Yeah. Sure. Now, mine's going to be this <laughs> There is a base. <laughs> there is a base. No, I'm not <laughs> now, either you can make the toe, or get somebody to make it for you. Thank you. Okay. Joe, can you pass the Okay, then take them into the library. <laughs> no, the library is <laughs> Okay, I think I wrote it. Thank up. you very much. But the thing is that what I did find with one of the libraries, Easton, which was very, the, the staff were so enthusiastic and so good there. And when I brought them a, um, a sample troll, the first thing they said was, oh, look at the show, Chris, oh, Chris, somebody, where's Chris? Chris was sitting at one of the library tables, doing this kind of silver. And the staff there don't feel undervalued because Chris Harding comes in at least once a month. Thank you for that. And <laughs> so what I'd ask you is when you take your troll in, have a look at the library, have a look at the buildings, have a look, talk to the library staff because they have very, very good ideas on how to create more income streams. There are friends of the libraries as well who have very good ideas as well. But hopefully, we'll get the general public to know when they open our resort. Okay, thanks very much indeed. Thank you. Um, and now we're moving on to item seven on the agenda, which is um, Joe's report on the constituency for the kids' Yeah, I'll do it very quickly. One more time, thank you for your report tonight. We've got more updates from the work we've been doing in the constituency for you. Um, it starts off with updates around environmental cleanup days. The last of which was in Rodney Street a couple of weeks ago. Um, and again, and Sheila um, were very integral into getting all the agencies to come. And Jean and Phil were there, and I think it was a very successful day also. Yeah. So um, there's a whole list of uh, different activities that have gone on uh, along with the skip cleanup days, but also work with the team have done. And some ideas we've got for the Best Head in Blue uh, next year. And John Booth is um, here from Oxford in Blue. Um, but I know you've got some other ideas, haven't you, as well, of um, looking at the park at Piano. Yes. Um, so, do you want to tell us a little bit about your ideas? <coughs> Well, the Arno is a, a rose garden which uh, a lot of you might know about. It's over 100 years old. And um, for the last 10 years, the council um, work on the, the, the Arno gardens has reduced. And the Friends of the Arno were formed 10 years ago now. And this year, in my involved with the Signal Gardens of Oxford and Hangman Baptist, I'm looking forward to um, doing. The, putting the iron of guards in for um, into the office of blue to see if we can get more recognition for the uh, Oxford and for Riddle. Yeah, that'd be brilliant. And a big thank you to you, John, because not only have you done Oxton, um, Oxton with Pimblu and the Secret Gardens, you've also um, Clawton and Bloom yes. as well, yeah. and um, sort of made, made that get delivered this year, and they, they also won the Wooden Award. So yes, 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 yes. Yeah. So hopefully we'll get more awards next year. So along with the, with the other, other 23 projects that we'll be building on next year, we'll also be uh, developing the Woodlands Park with Katie and, um, and Jean and Phil and, and Abraham and a lot of the local residents and we'll be looking to put that in as an in bloom project as well. Uh, so there's, there's a lot of activity going to be going on next summer and, um, and the build up to the summer as well um, and developing some of the, the projects that we started last year. Yeah, they're all just to know. Okay, there are some recommendations that the committee to know. Can ask if we note those on page 19? From page 19 onwards, we've got the updates from the, the food clubs, which are going into a bit of detail about the holiday food, holiday food provision um, over that took place in February half-term, um, and also an update on what's going to be offered over Easter. And we've 
It's not directly related to your report, so the chair might rule me out. No, this isn't council. And she's not a cabinet member, but go on. I just noticed that we are going ahead with one of the road safety schemes that we agreed back in 2016. Yeah. It was one of the ones that were on the reserve list, so which was quite pleasing. We've obviously found some additional funding. Yeah. It was actually the second uh, scheme on the reserve list. Uh, would I be right in thinking that the first scheme <coughs> that was on the reserve list might also go ahead? Yeah, can you just remind me what the first scheme was, or shall I pass the chapter? It was. It was across the, the borough. It was four roads. It's the ones that you highlighted, wasn't it? It's the ones that you've got, yeah, yeah. sort of junctions. Yeah, I'll check up on that, Alan, because I'm not quite sure. So if I can, I'll check up with Graham Row and then get back to you. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else? No? Right, well, I can say thank you very much for that, joke, And um, thanks, everybody, for coming along. It's a horrible night. You're very brave. You've got to fight your way back home now. Uh, but off you go. Thank you very much. Thank you.